Greetings, everyone, and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss topics relating to the appeal process of Robert Sylvester Kelly. And as of right now, we are waiting on the sentencing phase for the New York court um, scheduled for June 15th, 2022. So I want to share again that if you are interested in the drawing for the $25 cash app giveaway for May 29th, please review the information in the description box below. There are going to be three winners for that. So today I would like to share some information that may educate you on the average cost of incarceration within America. We know that Robert Sylvester Kelly is in the um, Bureau of Prisons, a Metropolitan Detention Center in New York City. And um, I, I did some research as a criminal justice major. The goal here is to get deeper into the reason behind incarceration and sentencing. So many of you are aware that, as that a Robert Sylvester Kelly was indicted on July 11th, 2019. Um, in Chicago on 13 counts of um, indictment, right? 21, Robert Sylvester Kelly was one of 1.8 million people incarcerated in the United States of America. Now, there is a total of 7.9 billion humans living on the face of the planet to this date. Statistics are taken from the world population clock, so you can look that up. Now, according to the Federal Registry, within the Bureau of Prisons Justice, September 1st, 2021 um, document, they were addressing the Office of General Counsel at 321st Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20534, researched by Sarah Korishi, telephone number 202353-8248. Now, under Title 28 of the Code of Federal Regulations, allowing for assessments of a fee to cover the average cost of incarceration for federal and state inmates, we will be calculating the cost representing the Bureau of Prisons monetary obligation based on 2019 information. They tend to reevaluate the statistics every four years. So based on fiscal year 2019, an inmate within the federal prisons in New York, for example, was charged an average cost of 66000 per year. This breaks down to almost $200 per day per inmate. And then I'm going to show you a table that's going to share with you exactly the overall cost. Okay. Now, according to Vera.org, prisons are institutions where all aspects of life are conducted and administered. The basic essential needs are staggering to the system's burden to providing adequate levels of security, programs and administrative staff to run the facility to supervise and provide services to incarcerated individuals, food distribution and educational opportunities, infrastructure maintenance and upkeep are needed to effectively run a prison, right? So now we're going to talk about the increasing operation, the increasing operational cost and significant levels of physical and mental health concerns. So that goes on in prison as well. People find out that they're sick because they now can pay more attention to their bodies while incarcerated. So that there's a significant level of physical and mental health concerns that go into this astronomical cost that I'm going to share with you as we go on. So out of 45 responding states, now, you know, I think the United States has 50 states. So out of 45 responding states. Okay, so I had to really look at these commas. So out of 45 states that reported, their expenditure total for one year was 42 billion 
$883,537,590 of incarcerated financial expenditures. What are your thoughts there? Because of the size of each state, the, um, the expenditure count varies. And there was a variation of how much each state receives. Now, in federal prisons, they receive much more financial support due to the fact that they are approximately, um, some people say, 120 to 200 federal prisons compared to 1,566 state prisons, 2,850 jails, and 1,510 juvenile correctional facilities. So let's talk about the disproportionate minority confinement. Now, I did my master's thesis on disproportionate minority confinement because I felt that it was a big problem back in 2012. So let's define what disproportionate minority confinement is. It's a condition that exists when a racial or ethnic group representation in confinement exceeds their representation in the general population. Now, out of the 1.8 million people incarcerated as of 2019 in the first statistic we discussed, the African American, according to the Bureau of Justice publication in 2019, at year's end stated there were 1,000 96 black prisoners per 100,000 black residents, 525 Hispanic per 100,000 Hispanic residents, and 214 white prisoners per 100,000 white residents. What percentage does the African American culture represent in America? 13%, right? Between 12 and 17%. Now, this is according to the race and ethnicity statistics in the U.S. So now we're going to look at some of these numbers on another level. So let's take New York prisons. As you can see in front of you, has over expenditure usage dollars of the population trillion. of 53,181 and this is a population of the incarcerated state. Um, the average cost for a inmate is $69,355. Now this is at a rate time per inmate. Now this is at a rate time per inmate per 53,181 individual inmates. So let's review Illinois as one. So we are now looking at an expenditure rate of $1,595,647,075 for an inmate average input of $33,507. Astronomical with the prison population total of 47,622 inmates with an average cost of $33,507. Now you multiply that, time the population of prison inmates. So I'm trying to paint a picture here through a statistic about the difference between state and federal penitentiaries as well as the state's varying so significantly based on this table in front of you. I would like to now ask the question, what are some trends that you see specifically in these tables? I could not put them all together. I would love to have had it as a, a way that I could scroll up and share with you. I don't know how to do that, but what I did was I broke it all down based upon, um, based upon state. So I would now like to speak on the Robert Sylvester Kelly case. Crime has not increased within the criminal justice system as of the pandemic. 
It is the sentencing guidelines and the sentencing laws that have changed to create, number one, the policymakers and public opinion creators to conclude on how criminal justice money should be spent. Number two, states per inmate cost is stated to to be reduced by increasing the number of people held in prisons, which creates an unsafe living condition. Third, costs vary across states due to regional cost of living. So this is the determining factor of whether a person will serve a sentence versus probation or parole or acquittal. These are things that I need to share with you so you'll know what the journey is on the criminal justice side of where Robert Sylvester Kelly is fighting. He is fighting for his life. He is fighting for possibly um, to be heard and understood. And in this, it's all about the bottom dollar. It's all about that bottom dollar. But guess what makes up the majority of expenditure that we recently discussed? 68% to be exact goes towards average salaries for corrections, employees, and administration. So that's more than half. And you're saying that this is what it takes to truly take care of an inmate from walking in the door until exiting, however they do, you know. And and I feel that this is very important to share with you because this is why an appeal may have to be possible because the system has become a monster and has burdened society at large. You know, um, the criminal justice system, um, how does this affect Robert Sylvester Kelly? You know, let's, let's get your opinion on that. Because if you think about it, the sentencing is in New York. It's going to produce more income than the Chicago trial, right? So New York is more, um, how can I put it, indebted to serve a sentence there than Chicago. Um, do you feel that this is how one should be punished financially, you know, to provide financial assistance? Because I believe that if the policy makers and the stakers of the criminal justice system has something invested in it, then they're the ones receiving the benefit and the kickback. They're hiring and employing over 68% of it, of of corrections officers and administrators that is not overseeing correctly and properly the inmate course the inmate that is incarcerated. So what are your thoughts there? So what are some lessons we can take from this conversation? Number 1, educating our society on the ways that decisions and choices can affect an a life outcome. I mean, this is a lot. If it's boiling down to money, how do we make sure we don't fall trapped to this incarcerated state, to this state of being? Um, educating our society on the way to make decisions and choices to affect positive life outcomes. That is very prominent. That is the most extensive thing that we can do. Number two, the earlier the choices that are made in the, in life, the younger a person can expect the, well, let's put it like this. The earlier a negative choice is made in life, the younger a person can expect to be part of this multi-trillion dollar industry. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, and I thank you for reiterating that statement. Um, one of my commenters just said that the younger you are, when you make positive situations, the further away from this criminal justice system you, you go. So you're going in the positive direction away from the system. But the more decisions you make on a negative vibration, 
you're going to go closer to closer to the system. So we got to get this information out to our youth. Thank you, commenter. Where do you hear of society hiring our cultural participants at $66,000 a year to begin to start with benefits to include those basic essential needs, dental, vision, a 401k, IRA, all of that versus those who will most likely become a part of this criminal justice system. Are they not willing to give up and share the, uh, the abundance of financial propensity? Or is it that they really are doing this for the sake of money, for the love of money? We are the ones we're waiting for. And we must look towards our future with a clear vision that is focused and aware that we can at least teach our culture that the system is made to hire those to keep the disproportionate minority confined. When we understand that, we can move forward. What are your thoughts about the statistics of how much of the population the minority makes up? to the population within the prison system that produces expenditures in the trillion dollar area mark. This is a problem for America. You know, I recently seen a fight that was on social media, of course, between two minority teens in school. The girl caused her victim to have a concussion by virtually attacking her. Just just going up to her and attacking her. Now, the victim is afraid to go back to school and has to be homeschooled while the perpetrator remains in school. This is now a criminal case that will haunt this young lady, the perpetrator, who, who obviously is another victim of crime because she obviously seen something in order to be this aggressive. OK, to brutally attack someone to where it takes a teacher to tell her, call her name four or five times and take two uh, students to pull her off of the victim. You know. Just because she felt like doing it and she said she felt good having done this after it was all over. But will she feel that way 10 years from now? And these are the extreme scenarios that our youth are under when it comes down to the public school system. And then I ask the question, is the public school system just as equally balanced to the criminal justice system? Because these are the only two educational sources that we can either move through or go into. And it's just, it's, it's something. So these stories make me say with confidence that the system doesn't always come looking for a minority to incarcerate. We have to be accountable. The system does not always come looking for a minority to incarcerate. However, it is bad enough that with all the stories we hear, one can see why they can easily make up something that, quote, could have taken place. Unquote. What are your thoughts? Thank you. Thank you. Now, Robert Sylvester Kelly's appeal is about the only other way to fight the beast of the American financial system, a.k.a. criminal justice system. As you think about what statistics have come out in today's segment, I want you to also review how R. Kelly can truly be acquitted. How can he be acquitted under these circumstances? How can he receive a fair trial? And many of my commenters are speaking specifically about a fair trial, an acquittal, a retrial. Um, you know, how can it be? Under these financial circumstances, who's going to lose that type of money in order to do the right thing within a system that is there 
to incarcerate at great astronomical speeds, the minority in particularly. How can he truly be acquitted regardless of the lies and the allegations against him without an appeal? He has to take it to a higher court. This process of an appeal has possibly a 90 day to a one year process. One thing I would like to leave you with is that this is a very positive thing. Even though we're talking these big high numbers, statistics and all that, I want you to understand that I am doing this to balance the fulcrum and educate because we need to know this information. How many people have sat back and just asked the question, how many people are in America and how many people out of those people that are in America are incarcerated disproportionately as a minority? Not too many, but I know that we do have individuals who think on that level. And I really appreciate that. So we're going to leave with a very positive note here. And it is the positive in the fact that we can teach our youth to learn from the Robert Sylvester Kelly case. Educating our youth about, as a female, how not to lie and try to destroy someone's character based upon being pushed, being manipulated into being sarcastically just choosing to do evil. To destroy another person's life is not worth it. Because guess what? You still, you still will not get what's coming to you. You will not get what's coming to you. Why? Because karma will not allow it. Guilt will set in specifically how people can do another a certain way for the love of money and see the fat lady has not sang yet in the case of Robert Sylvester Kelly so know this because exposing the truth through education and research will create a brighter day for all of us the entire world is at our fingertips on this social media education must be considered to be something that will help us get through this world, to get through this state of mind, this state of being, this state of, um, I guess, generationally being sub subliminally attacked mentally. We can do this. Yes, Robert had lots of money, but without education, where is his money? How did it affect him? How is it affecting him now? Without a strong network of positive individuals surrounding one, how will they ever be a true success? Yes, he has been a true success. And as he, quote, gotten older, that's when the attacks begin. You know, now, you know, the naysayers and everyone's saying, how he's washed up, he's played out, he's this, he's that. No, it wasn't even about that. It's not about that. It's about each one of us reaching each other and sharing a life experience so that others can choose for themselves what path they will eventually choose. He is in there doing the work of the Most High. He is in there opening and enlightening the minds, a superstar. It's kind of like being incarcerated is like with R. Kelly could be like, oh my God, this is a dream come true. This is a real superstar. So it doesn't make the individual who made that choice based upon the lack of education and the lack of resources and the lack of financial abilities uh, feel so bad about the choices they made because now they know that no matter what crime affects everyone even when a person lies crime affects everyone 
each one reach one and share your life experiences so that others can choose for themselves what path they will eventually choose because they see you as an example. They see you as a living witness. They see you as a living witness. I'm sorry. But in the end, the choice is 100% theirs after we have at least made them aware. Let's make them aware. Let's not keep failing our culture, our children, educate them, read to them, help them with financial literacy. Tell them that it takes over $200,000 to take care of a child from birth to the age of 18 years in America. And if they don't have three times that in their uh, in, in their bank account, they shouldn't be thinking about making babies because they can't support them. So you have the criminal justice system, the educational system, and the, the welfare system. That's holding a lot of people back. But we can invest more in our culture, in our society, if we just thought. Think it through. Think it through. Thank you so much for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing to this podcast. I will keep you posted. When I know something, you'll know something. And as always, keep it 100, and we'll see you next time.